Hi everybody, it's JP, and I thought I would do a video and take you back through some some work that I did a really long time ago, some of my early, early level design work. Uh, I was digging through it for just digging back, seeing what sorts of interesting things that there were for Autobio, and I was like, hey, I should look at some of my old level design work and I came across this thing that I realized might actually make a good little series of things to show in a video. So without any further ado, let me jump in and, and do that. So Half-Life came out in late 98, and I think I got it like immediately, because I had played this demo, prob uh, some probably illegal demo of it. And I played it, and I loved it, and I you know, played the normal game and then I was like I want to make levels for this. I had made Doom levels and I had made a I'd made a Quake level or two and I really wanted to make levels for Half-Life because I saw that there was all this cool single player stuff you could do. So I downloaded a uh, Worldcraft once it became available. Um, that was that was like a Quake 1 editor that became a Half-Life and then I think Valve hired the person responsible for World the developer on Worldcraft and it became Hammer at that point. Um, but the very first thing that I made, I mean, I probably made like a test room or something, but I wanted to take you back to the very first thing that I made in Half-Life. This would have been like in probably January of 1999. So the game had been out for a month or two. And yeah, this map is real bad. <laughs> um, it's not a good map, but um, yeah, I just kind of wanted to like run through it. It's a multiplayer map. Uh, you know, I was thinking very much in terms of like, hey, multiplayer is cool. I, I had been playing Half-Life Deathmatch over my terrible 56k modem. Well, it wasn't terrible as they came. I mean, it could have been worse, I guess. But, um, but yeah, and so I wanted to make a Deathmatch map, sort of, but I don't know how clear an idea I had of like what a Deathmatch map was. So I made this thing. <laughs> um, it's called Time, I think. As as best as I can remember, uh, so I was in I was in university at this point, and I uh, I had been listening to Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon a lot, and you know rediscovered a, a then twenty year old twenty five or so year old album, and um, yeah I don't know and so the third track off of that time I don't know I think that had been going through I, so I wanted to make something kind of with that sort of tone and also I just wanted to make like a map that took place inside of a big clock tower type thing you know with gears turning everywhere and sort of all that you know I'm sure like in retrospect uh, this this was making me remember something um, when I was a little kid I saw uh, the Disney film The Great Mouse Detective in the theater, and it's like mouse version of Sherlock Holmes and Watson and Moriarty, and the climactic battle or confrontation takes place in Big Ben, and because they're mice, like these gears are just like these gigantic things. Uh, it was actually an early use of CG, I believe. Like, I forget which group it was that did that that, that did that stuff but um, yeah there's just fall damage out the wazoo here anyway there's a cool scene in that where like they're running around and fighting and jumping around on these turning gears and stuff whoa okay cool all right yeah and so this is even implemented <laughs> sorry about that I guess I just I guess I just loaded up a half-life quick save that I had anyway whatever um so unfortunately even though i believe it is an included half-life one texture the signature clock face is not showing up in here um and this doesn't even make that much sense as a as like a clock face you know because it's in the middle of this weird chamber so it's not even like pointing out into the world like it's very unclear so I don't know this, like thematically and just whatever this this map was just real strange, um, and it was a real pain in the butt to navigate around. Like you were sort of taking fall damage all the time because of all this verticality. I mean, I I I thought that verticality was cool, and I wanted to make a map that had verticality. And then you climb up to like this weird little platform in front of this clock, and you get the magnum. 
Because I knew the Magnum was cool. Okay, and then there's more just stuff that breaks on you and lets you fall to your death. Um, I'm being very critical of my old work here, partly because the maps that we're going to jump to in a bit uh, are, are, are a little, you know, I improve. I got I got better quickly. I mean, this was Jan I made this in January, February of two thousand uh, of uh, of ninety nine, and then by the end of that year, I was doing stuff that would end up getting me my my first uh, level design professional level design job in the industry. Um, let me see if I can. Yeah, I was just I was I loved vents. I can tell you that. Um, yeah, and like for some reason, like I didn't. The player doesn't start with the crowbar in this map, and I don't even, and I don't even really know where it is. So let's just yeah, I mean like this is fine. We can no clip. No clipping is fine. Okay, so yeah, this is like a little supply closet sort of thing back here. We can see the night sky up here. Just a big crate pyramid, I guess. Up, oh, and you have to use the half life. The signature Half-Life 1 crouch jump to get up here. That's cool. Um, yeah, just so weird. Um, Alright, let's climb up into this vent here and see what exciting things. Um, yeah, I don't know if I thought that, like, players were supposed to be, like, sneaking around a bunch here. Or, or what, but... Um, See, I'm trying to get that grate open because I think it's destructible. Okay. Don't know. Uh, but yeah, these narrow little vents. Somehow I thought that that was good multiplayer map connectivity. Um, okay, and that's facing right out to the clock face. So yeah, I think you can kind of get the idea. Um, and there are these lifts on ground level that take you up. There's, like, cockroaches and gratings on the lowest floor. I think some of these are destructible, yeah. Oh, the shotgun is in a crate. Yeah, if I had, like, released... If I had been plugged into the map-making community at the time, they would have just... They would have just eviscerated me for... For all my weird newbie mistakes. Um, but that's one thing about, like, my, my early mapping stuff is that um, I did eventually fall in with... Um, some or other mapping community, um, and you know, so like, kind of got into like exchanging works in progress and giving feedback and stuff. But um, yeah, for like the first year or two that I was, I don't know. I mean, for a while that I was doing it, I wasn't really like plugged into a a community of people doing this stuff. So um, you know, I just I was just coming from it was it was a very I was just coming from a non-existent tradition or I don't know I don't even know what you want to call it but um, yeah what oh yeah and this was this was what I was using as my uh, personal logo at the time a gear with a heart in it that was just sort of my thing and I did like this I, I was clearly getting fancy with BSP because I did like these kind of arched windows although that's sort of it's probably off-grid and miserable in some way um, but yeah, yeah, and the texture alignment's fine. Anyway, um, so yeah, I made this thing, and then uh, time passed, and I did the work that I did another Half-Life thing. I released that summer. I released a Half-Life map to the community, and it got reviewed, and it got got a very positive review, and that that was very encouraging. I was like, yeah, maybe I should keep making more maps. Um, and then eventually I did the later, like late that, over that summer and then late that year, uh, I started doing, working on the unreleased, nobody's ever seen it, I don't think, on the internet, um, the mod work, the, the mod, the little mini mod thing that ended up getting me my first, my level design job at Human Head. So yeah, and then, uh, so over the course of like most of 2000, uh, I worked on Blair Witch Volume 2, The Legend of Coffin Rock. That was my first project in the game industry. I should definitely stream that at some point. Um, hold on, let me make sure that I am recording properly here. Cool, all right, we're still recording. Seems all good. Um, yeah, and so then uh, Blair Witch wrapped up and I had been 
all that summer of 2000, I had been, I, I knew that uh, we were going to be doing more stuff with the Unreal Engine, and I was very keen to like get get more experience with Unreal Engine. I had dabbled with it a tiny bit, um, and then I had made uh, a, a CTF map that summer, which I believe I showed in one of the, in that Unreal tournament CTF map. <coughs> Uh, stream that I did um, that one time. Uh, but then, yeah, like Blair Witch shipped and it was decided that we were going to do a multiplayer expansion for Rune uh, and that ended up being released as Halls of Valhalla. And so what I did, um, I was like, okay, cool. Um, and I was, I had been making Unreal Tournament maps and Unreal Tournament had released a newer version of Unreal Ed in one of the patches, like Unreal Unreal Tournament patch 436 added Unreal Unreal Ed 2.0, which was a completely rewritten version of Unreal Ed that uh, was way nicer than the Visual Basic sort of monstrosity that they had shipped Unreal One uh, and that the Rune team had shipped the original Rune with. Um, but I noticed that the map format f between Rune and Unreal Tournament there wasn't any, there weren't any binary differences, so I could basically if I copied over the Rune texture packages into my Unreal Tournament directory, I could use the fancy new Unreal Unreal Ed to make Rune maps. Um, and because specifically it had like really way better uh, vertex manipulation, like you could like move verts around on brushes and it wouldn't get all wouldn't get all wonky. Um, so yeah, that was really cool. And so I made several maps. I ended up shipping like five maps, I think, for Rune Halls of Valhalla. And I, I think that having that that cooler version of Unreal it definitely helped me be productive and prolific on on that project. Um, but this is a map that uh, this is a Rune map. I, I'm I'm opening it in Unreal Tournament just because I don't think I have an early like this is the earliest version that I have of of this map still in my archives. And um, yeah, so this is a rune map. I'm just opening it Unreal, in, a, in Unreal Engine because, um, it, with the exception of this missing texture here, with missing clock face texture is is a theme for these first few iterations. I'm sure I could get it working if I dug around and found the right package or recreated the package. But anyway, take my word for it, and you'll see it soon in other versions of this map. Um, but yeah, the so this was a rune map, and the idea was that I think was that um, this was going to be. Uh, this was a clock tower. Rune was like this kind of dark fantasy based on North mythology. So it's like Vikings, but they live in a completely magical world where there's like undead and goblins and dwarves and stuff. And so my concept for this map, it was going to be a deathmatch map, a Rune deathmatch map. And you were running around in a gigantic clock. And it was a dwarven clock because the dwarves were the ones in that universe who were making all of the steampunky type, you know, industrial type stuff. So it's like, okay, big clock tower, cool thing, um, big clock face, and it's in this kind of surreal sort of Roger Dean or, I don't know, fantasy illustration-y kind of like void um, with with these other clock towers rearing up out of the, out of the, out of the, out of the mist or something. So yeah, that's what's going on in that skybox there. And this is a very early version of the layout. I'm going to open a newer version of it in Rune itself, a, a, a later version of it in Rune itself. So yeah, there was like the front area and then like there was this whole thing, which I think I was only just beginning to, to detail. Um, let me fly around a little bit here and just give you more of a sense of... Uh, and yeah, the thing that... Um, that I sort of immediately, the visual that I really liked was, first of all, you know, I was like an architecture and art history nerd going back to art school. And um, yeah, and I just, I liked Gothic, you know, cathedral architecture and stuff like that and these flying buttresses. And it's like, I want to build something with flying buttresses in Unreal. Um, and I did. Um, okay, so yeah, that's the Unreal Tournament version of this. So now let's jump over to, and I hope this I hope this runs properly. Uh oh, yeah, I'm running Rune in Wine here, but I think this should work. Okay. Hmm. What do you think? All right, there we go. Cool. Okay. So, um, all right, so yeah, here we are in Rune. Uh, I should definitely go back to Rune at some point and like go like play through 
the maps that I contributed to Halls of Valhalla uh, in the shipping version. Um, just because there's a bunch to talk about, and you know, I, I remember Rune pretty fondly. Like that was, you know, that was that was sort of the first like bigger scale AAA project that I had any kind of involvement in. Um, so yeah, this is a a later version of that map. Uh, see, we still I've still got my heart and gear icon that I'm working in. Um, this archway texture, I believe, did ship with Halls of Valhalla. I made the Cathedral Arena map. So I think that's in there. So yeah, the outside of it, uh, clock, clock face is still not showing up. Um, we've got some more detailing. Yeah, I guess I tweaked some of these a little. Yeah, I just sort of changed this stuff around a little bit. I've got sort of a different style of archway here. Um, but yeah, this is still a very rough <laughs> map. Like, you know, it's... Yeah, I think the idea was I was working on this as a possible sixth map to include with Halls of Valhalla, but I don't think I, you know, had enough time to finish it. I was busy enough just finishing up my five maps. Um, but yeah, so, and I think maybe I was planning like, hey, I'll just finish this in my spare time and then release it to the community because a few of the human head mappers had done had done that before, and the community always likes it when they get a new free map. Um, so yeah, this thing, this is a weird, confusing layout here. Um, I think it still definitely needed some time in the oven. Um, I do like these rune textures. I miss a lot of these, like a lot of good stony kind of textures. Um, and yeah, like very talented art team on on rune. You know, some 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 raven guys and and stuff like that who who really knew how to who really knew how to how to paint. Um, this was sort of like a yeah, like I liked this feature. Am I gonna fall through that? Yeah, okay. Um, oh wait, I have to type uh, cheat please. That's that's what you have to type at the console before cheats are enabled in Rune. Um, yeah, so let's see where are we going here. Right. Okay, so there's still an outdoor sort of. There's still like a little duck out onto a. I don't know if you'd call it a balcony or what here. Oh, that's right, and we're above. Yeah, there's just all kinds of stuff going on with this map. Um, right, so you would go up here. Not enough room power. Let's see here. Yeah, and definitely quite um, <laughs> like abstract. Like I was really just sort of noodling on stuff that I thought was cool looking. Um, I don't know. Yeah, this would have had real problems as a deathmatch map, I think. Like, these hallways are pretty tight for fighting. That's going to be rough in a game where everybody's just meleeing each other a lot. Um, I don't know. Yeah, so I think that even that this version of it was still pretty pretty flawed. Um, but, you know, I was, I was sort of, like, developing it. I mean, it was certainly, like, give it... If this was a second generation after the first generation of that Half-Life map that I made, you know, I'm definitely, like, there's definitely some real level design thinking happening here. Um, I guess this is like a counterweight type system or something. Yeah, like when you step off of it. So I think that was just like a way of getting the player down to the down to ground level here safely. I think that was also, that's also just a death pit because, I don't know. Um... But yeah, I would say that this is definitely not a very good map. <laughs> it's, um, I don't really like a lot of what it's doing here. It's just kind of, it's just kind of pointlessly confusing and stuff. Um, I think I still have like this little walkway here. Let's see, where is it? Oh, that's right. Yeah, you come out here. Jeez, here's like a whole such section that I didn't even really realize was here. So yeah, the it's a it's a weird mazy little beast for being a, a deathmatch level. Um, yeah, but it does still have the uh, that visual of like the f the moon framed in the flying buttress, well, sort of framed. Um, you know, uh, I think actually also I probably scaled up the entire map. Like we had a utility that would like you know just multiply a map scale by whatever decimal number you gave it, um, and I think I made it really gigantic 
to start with. Uh, well, when I imported it into Rune, um, just because obviously like the third person camera has a really big impact on, you know. So anyway, I think that's about enough for the Rune version of this map. Um, and then, uh, let's see, yeah, what all happened? Um, yeah, we shipped Rune Halls of Valhalla um, over the course of 2001, um, Human Head, like, was trying to land new projects. Um, I started working on the demo for... I worked on Prey for a little bit. I've got a weird Unreal Tournament map that I can show you that has something to do with that. Um, and then I ended up starting to work on um, the uh, a pitch demo for what became Dead Man's Hand, the Unreal Engine 2 Western FPS that shipped on Xbox and, I guess... Windows um, eventually in 2003, um, and I left Human Head before before that game, before that project shipped. But sometime during 2001, I think I got the mapping itch, just like you know the spare time mapping itch. And I think what I chose at that time was um, was uh, let's see, was Quake 3. Um, I had I don't know I had been playing Quake 3. It you know I had kind of gotten over Unreal Tournament. I mean, you know, I, I still, there wasn't like a, there wasn't a single thing that precipitated that, but I was like, hey, I should make a, um, I should make a, uh, I should make a Quake 3 map. Um, also, I guess, uh, Human Head had licensed um, the Doom 3 engine, and I hadn't mapped for, 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 for Prey, and I hadn't mapped for an id engine in a while, so I, I just, you know, just kind of wanted to dig into to dig into Quake Three. So anyway, this is a Quake Three deathmatch version of that, and here we can finally see the clock face texture that I did for Rune. Um, obviously, this is like that's like a dwarven. I don't know. I mean, it's it's like I guess you know it's probably one of the more bits of pieces of uh, more impressive bits of texture art that I did like back in those days. Um, I mean, I, I kind of like the, the, the lighting rendering on it, but, um, like, the Celtic, the pseudo-Celtic knot stuff on it is, like, I really don't like the way that that looks, and then just, like, the use of totally random runes in place of numbers, like, I don't like that. So, I don't know. You know, this was my cool centerpiece piece of art, and then I was mixing it in with, like, just standard Quake 3, you know, Ken Scott, like you know, hell, skull, cyber stuff. Um, but yeah, so yeah, but that was originally, that's what you would have seen instead of the uh, Unreal default texture in, in those earlier versions of the map. Um, so yeah, this version of the map, um, I had kind of forgotten all, almost entirely about this version of this map. Um, and it's, it's not bad, actually. Like, it's actually kind of closer to being a decent... Um, deathmatch map then I don't know each each time I took a crack at this map theme or whatever yeah okay and there's there's still my the logo I guess I was still using that logo and I sort of modified a quake texture and put put my little stamp on that banner um, also I was learning the um, the quake 3 shading language so I had like this metal texture here this is just random corner greeble pile but I made this metal texture um, I think maybe for the half-life projects. Um, and then I'd like give it a specular map and stuff. And then this thing has like a little vertex jello on it to make it look like the flag, the flag is flapping in the breeze. And I was using like the curved surfaces and stuff, you know, just doing that whole thing that Quake 3 loves to do, you know, making really smoothly rounded pillars and archways. I mean, yeah, like this, this takes a lot of work actually to like align these textures and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, like I, I obviously didn't get it exactly right here. Um, and then, yeah, of course, the jump pads. Um, but yeah, I feel like flow-wise, this map is not terrible. I, I, I was playing it with some bots earlier. I guess I could... Um, let, me summon in, let me summon in some dooms. Um, yeah, and it's still got that little sort of, you know, thick cutaway kind of window thing. I don't even know what you would call that feature. But... Um, and then this little, you kind of go for under here, and um, yeah. So this area is kind of interesting, you know. 
Um, and I'm, I'm definitely taking care to do the, uh, to sort of execute in the way that's, you know, sort of expected of, uh, I put a little gargle on the corner here just because this was like an included, like Quake 3 included this, this deco mesh, and I was like, yeah, I should have some gargoyles here, so we'll use the cool cyber lion or whatever. Um, and then it's got a whole upper level here. We'll jump up, take a jump pad up there. This is sort of like a belfry kind of feeling thing. Let me just deal with this guy. Um, yeah, and then we've got like these, you know, this sort of network of jump pads. I think all of these get you... Um, yeah, and either of those will get you the real gun. Um, yeah, the item placement in this map is definitely... That's, that's the thing I was noticing when I was playing it earlier. The item placement in this is definitely not so good. Um, just, I don't know, like, the railgun is way too close to the red armor and is way too close to the mega health, and the rocket launcher is probably not as prominent as it should be. Yeah, you know, I like this, you know? I was also, like, just sort of getting a sense for, for, the, for how to light in, in this engine, you know? And it's like, okay, let's have, let's have a bright light coming through here. I don't know, I mean, yeah, I was still definitely learning. Um... Okay, yeah, and I think that's about all the... I think I've explored just about everywhere in this ma in this version of the map. I don't know why that diagonal angle was there, I guess. I do like that Quake 3 encouraged this fairly free-flowing... Just the levels were unambiguously not, not fiction-driven and not, you know, and they were multiplayer, so they didn't have a story progression, so... It's a very different set of, of constraints for the uh, for level design, and it's just I don't know. It was almost kind of the last hurrah of the abstract, weird quake spaces. You know, like Quake Doom's level design was quite abstract. Um, oh, you got me. Uh, you know, Quake One's level design was quite abstract, um, and then yeah, Doom. Uh, sorry, Quake Three. You know was definitely, um, you know, just by being multiplayer focused. Hold on, sorry, got to deal with this Jerko. Oh, it's down there. Anyway, um, and yeah, it had like these big like showpiece textures that it was just like, okay, I guess I'll just make this jump pad like sort of tailored to that. Um, <laughs> the, the, yeah, like those big centerpiece textures you it sort of like encourage you to design a level for them i mean this was right on the right on the edge of this was only a couple of years shy of the era when you started having high detail deco meshes like static meshes in unreal in unreal engine terminology um you know where you do have to like sort of make space for it in your brushwork and all that kind of stuff um so yeah um so i made that version of it i think in like the summer of 2001, and then I set this aside for a while, and then I think in December of that year, on into like January of that year, I made another version of this map. Um, oh, and let me remove this bot because we don't really need delete. Okay, Doom was kicked. Um, so this is a completely different... This is like a remix of this this level. I think... Um, like, I forget exactly what my thought process was going between these different iterations was. But um, that last map, that last version of the map that you saw was... Um, it was pretty spread out, you know? Like, you could summon in, like, four bots, and that would be, like, about the right player density for that amount of space and that complexity of space. Whereas I think I wanted something that was more 1v1, you know? I wanted just, like, something that was very tightly focused around this clockwork thing. Um, and so, yeah, this was the... I think this was the most advanced version of it that I made for Quake 3. Um, and, yeah, that's just a placeholder. I think I was, like, experimenting with making these little portal-type things. These blue fires are teleporters, obviously. I needed some way to show that. I think originally I had, like, the Quake 3, like, just teleporter arch thingy that looks like the Quake 2 teleporter. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I, I think the blue flames were just intended to be temp, but then I didn't go back to it. Oh yeah, no, actually, um, yeah, like, this is a this is a new asset. Like, I made... 
Um, yeah, I made this little shape right here um, just in like 3D Studio Max probably and then turned it into an MB3 because I wanted to understand how that pipeline worked. And then this texture right here, I actually wanted to use, uh, I don't think I have a working example of these. Yeah, these are all broken for some reason. Um, but I was going to use Quake 3's portals. Like Quake 3 does have limited support for drawing like, um, I don't know if it's render to texture or just like just playing with the visibility system. But yeah, um, because I wanted like, you know, obviously this new version of this map is leaning super heavily on teleporters, like d heavily on teleporters to a fault, I would say. Um, and so I wanted to like visualize um, what your teleport destination was going to was going to be, you know, because like you see this map full of teleporters, and you're like, well, this is, you know, I'm like basically like in that Escher space at the end of Labyrinth, you know, <laughs> I, I just said, you know, I, I have, there's no, it's incredibly vertical. There's not a lot of rhyme or reason to it. Where, where does this teleporter go? Um, and yeah, I think I remember play testing this with uh, my friend Aubrey Hesselgren. Um, and yeah, and I think, yeah, I think he was, he gave me that feedback that was like, yeah, you need to know where the teleporters are taking you so that, you know, you have like sort of a way of learning the map. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, like I think so. I feel like this this is, you know, a better step in a, a step in a more right direction. I think in a lot of ways, um, this thing is kind of cramped to to play deathmatch in. I would say, um, you know, like it's it's a little close for you know you're, you're you're basically going to be fighting up close with people most of the time in this map, which is not necessarily a bad thing. There's some. There's some good Quake 3 maps that do that. Um, I don't like this bit at all, where you're like sort of like stumbling up these angles. Like s these angles like kind of kill your velocity. And if you're you know if you're doing Quake 3 type stuff, where you're bunny hopping around and trying to build up like good speed, um, like that just sort of kills it. And in future versions, uh, that that will go away. Um, but yeah, um, and I I, tr I did try to position these teleporters such that um, there was sort of a consistency to it. Like that one goes to that one. Let me let me confirm that that's the case. Yeah. So like, uh, and then that one goes to that one. That one goes up to that one. And so there's almost like this sense of, and then that one goes to that one. So there is sort of this sense of like spatial semi-contiguity or like, you know, there's, there's never a case that like a teleporter will take you to like the opposite end of the map or something. Um, yeah, and then this thing like is taking you, you know, from there to there, from there to up there. So it, it is helping you change height levels, basically. Um, I think I might have tried a version of this that had jump pads, but just in the normal course of moving around the map, you were in the air so much that you were just a really ripe target for railgunning out of the air. And when you're on one of those jump pads, as anybody who's played Q3DM17 uh, can attest, when you're on, when you're flying through the air on one of those jump pads at high speed, and somebody knocks you off course with a with a railgun, you're basically falling to your death, and that's like, that that's funny if it happens once, but it's frustrating if it happens like, you know, a bunch of times. So yeah, this version of the map is is sort of rougher. Like I wasn't bothering with all of the like sort of geo detailing type stuff because I was just like I want I just want to make like a rough layout version of this. Um, you know, that feels right before I put any more work into it. Um, yeah, so I think that's about all I've got for that part of, for that incarnation of the map. Now, I think I also, I, I don't actually remember when I made this or why, but um, this is, I made a Quake 1 version of that same map. You can definitely recognize a lot of the features here. Um, and I'm not sure if I... I think I might have actually made this after the Quake 3 one. Um, and yeah, none of the... Like, this is... Obviously, this does not have lighting built, so it probably looks like... Looks like death on the, you know, on the actual streaming codec and stuff. But um, yeah, so obviously there's not much to this. But I did make a Quake 1 version of that. And yeah, just as a... I don't know... Actually, yeah, if you let me see, 
see what the what the date stamp on that is because uh, clock one clock one BSP. Oh, okay. So this was actually yeah. This was this was way after this was way after that. I guess yeah. I was like. I don't know. Okay, so uh, so yeah, this is actually this actually comes at the end of the chronology for this map. Um, so now let's. So I, I set that aside and um, I yeah, like you know, I wasn't um, yeah. I, I set Quake Three aside. I started working on Dead Man's Hand um, and actually just. <laughs> just because I am now very curious about the chronology for this stuff. Let me see what... Okay, so Clockwork 13 is 2003. Okay. Yeah, so this would have been right around the time that I quit Human Head. Anyway, so um, <laughs> the next engine that I, <laughs> that I tried making this map in... Um, was Unreal Tournament 2003. Uh, I, it, it happened. It, you can open it in 2000 in Unreal Tournament 2004, um, which is what I have and what runs on Linux and stuff. But um, oh, and there's going to be bots in here. Kill bots. Kill bots. Um, okay, so yeah, so and this is basically the most advanced version of this map that ever got made, really. Um, and what's interesting about this is that um, yeah, I mean like the clock hands move. Um, and I'm using like a projected texture to like project, create this illusion that light's filtering through the clock face, you know, and like you're seeing the shadows of the hands and stuff. This probably performed like garbage on 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 a weak machine at the time, but I don't know if I really cared. But um, you know, this is an unfinished map, and the thing that you can clearly see that I'm trying to work out here is how to incorporate static meshes with BSP. Uh, with with the constructive solid geometry brushes that that Unreal uses, um, and I was only really semi-successful. This would have been around the time that I was, you know, getting out of the art game basically. Like I made um, this is a custom mesh that I made uh, in 3D Studio Max, uh, and I did like my own little material for it, and I you know, I wanted to have these be reflection, like, non-live reflection map versions of the scene that it was going to, because I was still like, yeah, player needs to know where they're going when they go through a, through a thing. Um, but yeah, um, alright, let's get out here, yeah, because this gives you a good view of it. Um, yeah, so, uh, right, so this is the whole clock face, and it's using, like, you know, that rebar texture and a bunch of other things. Um, it's using um although actually i think um so i think i can point out which of these are which of these meshes are mine that is my mesh you know just because you can recognize its ancestor in in the quake 3 version um this clock face trim is my mesh and texture uh, and then also like this thing that goes with it like this sort of stonework that anchors it in just a flat brick surface that is also my mesh um, I think all of this other stuff was just me kind of going through the big library that, of static meshes that it comes with um, and being like, yeah, what what can I use? Oh, okay, yeah, DM Curse 2 is using this brick greeble texture. I guess I'll throw that in. And, oh, there's like this, this weird shape thing. And, oh, there's some, you know, so... Um, and yeah, like I really don't like a lot of this just sort of fussy looking for places to put detail detail. I mean, to an extent, like it sort of defines Unreal Tournament 2004 era level design period and uh, but and also more specifically sort of what Epic was doing. There was like this gear doorway and I was like, "Okay, well yeah, I think I'll use that." You know, there was this pressure to like not just have bare BSP. Um and to be fair, like this it, it does look weird when you've got got bare BSP, just really low detail stuff, but like a high res texture and, you know, these high detail decoration meshes. And then I think also this cornerstone I think this this cornerstone mesh was also my mesh and texture, which I mean it's super basic, but because I had my wall thickness settled and well, maybe not entirely settled. Um and yeah, I just wanted something to like kind of anchor it, you know. It's still just weird, you know, seat of the pants, fantastical architecture sort of stuff. And I mean, you know, the fantastical part of it was definitely intentional and and valid. But um, yeah, oh yeah, and I think uh, this was yeah, this was a handle that I was using at the time. So I was signing my name on the little cornerstone there. 
Um, we've still got, you know, this feature left over from, like, the, the early rune versions of this map, where it's just like, yeah, you know, a corridor with these diagonal windows slicing in. I don't know, this map, that mesh shows up everywhere in Unreal Tournament maps. Um, yeah, and actually this gargoyle, um, much like I said, uh, you know, in that, in that video that I did on, um, on that beast's prototype, um, my ex did this gargoyle mesh, actually, for this, like, for this map, basically. Like, she modeled creatures and stuff, uh, as, as well, but, um, just, you know, she, she was a modeler and animator, uh, early in her career. Uh, but yeah, she made this cool gargoyle, and I gave it a prominent position. Um, so yeah, that is, yeah, that is a, that is a contribution of hers to a map that I made, which is, uh, which is weird to think about, um. So yeah, um, so this was basically, I mean, it looks like I did dust this thing, dust it out, dust off this layout one more time for Quake 1, but that never really got off the ground. Um, I think by this point I had sort of given up on trying to make this map a reality, you know? Um, I had taken it through a bunch of different iterations, and I think at this point I was also just feeling the, the thing that a lot of level designers were feeling around this time, like... Do I want to specialize and become a full-on, like, environment artist? Or do I want to, like, still be just a level designer who only mainly worries about layout and item placement and works with or just uses meshes that it, and textures that another artist has made? Um, and that was a big split. Like, that was a really significant shift in level design at that time. And it carried through to, you know, a few years later when I was working on Bioshock, you know, where we had a full-on environment art department and a full-on design department and yeah like when they worked well together um we got really awesome results and when they didn't work well together you know we had kind of a dysfunctional uh you know working situation but um i mean that that tension was really like happening all over the industry i think um and yeah and i i i, I would say like you know offering some of my own perspective on it I do think that um, that doing good level design got harder in some ways during that period because, you know, level designers were having to juggle a bunch of extra things, and particularly for multiplayer level design, where it really is just like make a good layout. Like the layout is is such a is like the central determinant of the map's like ultimate quality. You know, um, you know if if it's if it's per being per built for the purpose of being a space supporting multiplayer gameplay um you know like it, the, the aesthetics need to like be be complementary and and good obviously like you know you don't you don't want to do a bad job with that but like the le multiplayer map layouts have this kind of centrality and like what parts of that level that sort of level design is is really doing the the communicating the heavy lifting whatever so um I don't know, yeah, and then I think eventually, you know, by the end of that decade, people had kind of figured it out, you know, and also games had gotten big enough in terms of the teams required to make them that, you know, it was arguably a fundamentally different discipline anyway, so. But yeah, that's Clockwork. Um, <laughs> that's this weird map that I took from <laughs> about 1999 until 2002, 2003-ish. Um, and it's really weird. Like, I, I started realizing, like, I, I had forgotten a lot of the history of this map, and, like, I have archives where I, I keep all of this stuff, and I was sort of digging through them and being like, oh, yeah, wow, there's really, like... <laughs> I was I was kind of obsessed with this idea for a few years. Um, and I find that kind of interesting. I think um, this idea, unlike other ideas that I get obsessed with. Um, I think this idea ultimately didn't have a lot of a lot of substance to it. Like it had a clock tower thing and it had this kind of like verticality and space knit together in a sort of non Euclidean way. Um, you know, I think I think those are those are all potentially interesting ingredients, but they didn't really gel into something um, I don't know. Yeah, so I think there's probably a good reason that I abandoned it. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I might have also just been burnt out on designing levels because that was certainly a factor in, you know, in, in why I quit Human Head and, you know, why I just didn't do level design for a while. Um, 
Yeah. I don't know. I think I, like it's interesting to me when designers, when creative people in general, but like, you know, when when designers of video games get kind of obsessed with something and they don't just like and they keep attacking a problem maybe unsuccessfully, you know. Um so yeah, if y'all know of any of any other situations where somebody has been kind of obsessed with an idea like that and has sort of bashed themselves against it multiple times, um, let me know in the comments. Because uh, yeah, I think there's there's something interesting about that, and um, there's definitely some other ideas that I have been or continue to be obsessed with, and I'm sort of rehashing endlessly. And I'll do another video sometime that talks about those, or maybe I'll talk about one particular example of that in autobiographical architecture. Um, so yeah, you'll just have to wait and see. But uh, yeah, I think that's about all I've got for this. Um, let's see, do I have any other weird... Yeah, we went Half-Life, Unreal Tournament, Rune, Quake 3, Quake 1, <laughs> Unreal Tournament 2004. Yeah, I think that's about... I think that's about... That, co that about covers it for, for Clockwork. Uh, but yeah, thank you for watching. Um, I'm curious, to, I haven't really ever shown all of these things together to people, so I'm curious as to what you think. Uh, so let me know in the comments if you have any thoughts about this. And thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Thanks a lot. Bye.